I'm Jim DeCosta, spokesperson of the Faculty Honors Committee here at Fairfield Ward High School. The purpose of our committee is to secure and safeguard in a central location the awards and certificates representing the excellence, academic accomplishments, and memorials of our staff, teachers, coaches, and administrators. Our special recognition of legendary teachers is to provide a view into the excellence, accomplishments, and atmosphere of each generation of teachers going back as far as we can in the history of our school. We have safeguarded as far back as the 1970s with the inclusion of Coach Fern Tetro, teacher Bob Gillette, and others. We hope you'll enjoy the current segment and the history of our program. Thank you. I'm Jim DeCosta, spokesperson of the Faculty Honors Committee. My fellow committee members are Jeanette Faber, Ross Novick, Peter Shinazu, and Jason Shaughnessy. Our purpose is to secure and safeguard a central location for awards and memorials of our teachers, coaches, and administrators. Faculty Honors is for us and by us <coughs> within these walls as we've transitioned from Andrew Ward High School, Fairfield High School, and now Fair, Fairfield Ward High School. Recognizing legendary teachers gives us a view into the creativity, accomplishments, and atmosphere in our school during each successive generation. And it's gonna be the cornerstone of our program this afternoon to do that. <clears throat> Very happily, Paul has embraced the recognition of faculty and when awards have, been, have come up during the year, he's made it a part of the regular faculty meetings to, to make us all aware of that. That was not true in the past, so that's wonderful, and it means we've, I don't have a backlog of business. <coughs> the two things, the two items that I'm gonna mention is that, uh, to emphasize that this is by us and for us, if you notice something, please bring it to our attention. For example, a couple of summers ago, I was walking around the building with Charles <coughs> Flynn, as, a, as is our habit to decompress and to, and to talk, and I noticed that the James Blake plaque dedicating the tennis court was missing. And what happened is that the school system and its diligence in repairing the, the fencing, which needed to be repaired, the company that it contracted, they took down the fencing, plaque went with it, thrown out, never to be seen again. So I noticed it, and I decided uh, to make the replacement better, because I, I remember when it was dedicated in 2006 that one of the regrets was not having co-named co it the James and Thomas Blake Jr. Uh, courts. And then I also realized that not only do our students, many not know who James Blake was, but we've got staff who don't know that James Blake came to this school. So the new plaque, and this is, a, this is a duplicate, I put three of these up. So one of them faces the parking lot, and two of them are on opposite ends of the courts facing inside, and they've got a bunch of the James Blake and Thomas Blake Jr. statistics. Among them, we named the coach, so John Honey, gets recognition. I mean, James Blake would probably be James Blake with, without many of us, but uh, John Honey was an exceptional coach, and he's recognized as, as the coach, and he had great anecdotes. I talked to him about this. He said that at the end of his matches, that James would report back to mom, and mom invariably, and John Honey said this, this happened several times, mom <coughs> would ask him how many games the, op the opponent won, she knowing that her son was a superstar and fully capable of running the, running the table. 
and it was important to her in her teaching humility to him that he lost some games so that those players would be able to remember forever that they, they, they got a game on James Blake and they scored a couple of points. He was that good. <clears throat> Listen to, to these statistics. James Blake was all FCAC 1994 to 97. He was three-time All-State, repeat winner in class LL singles, finished his senior season 13 and 0. He was the 1996 United States Tennis Association National Indoor Champion. He joined his older brother Thomas, who was no slouch, having been uh, spectacular. Then he was, uh, Thomas was all FCAC 1992 to 94. He joined Thomas at Harvard and became Harvard's first freshman All-American. And we know that a lot of spectacular athletes went to Harvard, and James Blake was their first freshman All-American. His doubles ranking, often playing with brother Thomas, rose to 31, number 31 in the world. James Blake had a professional career spanning from 1999 to 2013, and his highest ranking worldwide was number four, which he achieved seven years into his career in 2006. He was awarded the Arthur Ashe Humanitarian of the Year Award in 2008 for founding the Thomas Blake Sr. Memorial Research Fund at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So if you see something, say something, and we'll get the, the recognition in place. And if we can't, if we can think of it, we will improve. Now, as far as I know, nobody applied for the Brian Fagan grant during COVID. And I've said this at presentations before, no one is keeping track of the Brian Fagan grants. So if you get the Brian Fagan grant to study administration, you've got to let us know so that we can recognize you and, and get your name on the name plaque. Okay. Our history is inspiring. Working slowly and carefully, the Faculty Honors Committee has built and secured an understanding of the past 50 years at our school. We have our legendary teacher's plaque with nameplates, which I brought into the auditorium. We've got our poster with photographs of these people, and we have written testimonials from dozens of students preserved in two binders. <clears throat> We've got the master, which is in the room, and which is bolted down. <laughs> and then we have this extra backup copy that's on the permanent display in the, in the library, just in case. <clears throat> so the, the origin of the faculty honors display as we have it happened during a renovation of the building when all of the teacher recognition plaques were taken down, never to be seen again. So things happen. People move on to other buildings, plaques go away, <laughs> so that's why we're taking extra care to bolt things down and have extra copies of things. A picture of the last two generations of English teachers comes from Charles Abraham and Bob Gillette. Social studies through Jack Strauss and Colleen Kelly our coaching staff through Fern Tetro, for whom the football field is named. Math through Joe Cron, world languages through Marie Hayes, science through Andy Bednarik, technology engineering from John Cassay. And today, we add our music department by focusing on the creation of Carillon Concert, which drew hundreds of visitors to Fairfield High School for years and distinguished our music program above all others in Connecticut. And in its creative inception, the Carillon concert was held in the gym with lights down and lasers, and the tickets were, were very hotly sought after. Uh, and we have the, the manager of all, the distribution of all those tickets is gonna tell us the, the history of the Carillon concert before it fades from memory. With that, uh, we're gonna have two musical presentations. And the first is gonna happen right now. And we'll have Lisa and Elizabeth uh, introduce themselves, then we'll have the history of Carillon, and we'll end with uh, an additional musical presentation, and then we'll dedicate the plaque. Elizabeth and I are Shields, class of 2004.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to be back at Fairfield Ward High School, where I spent many hours rehearsing and conducting, teaching. When Jim DaCosta asked me to help him gather information for the ceremony today, I mentioned that there was no way to speak of Carillon without going back to its precursor, Spectrum. Thus, the story begins in 1987. In the fall of that year, a new school was formed when Roger Ludlow High School and Andrew Ward High School consolidated. The school population doubled, and so did the music department. But it wasn't an easy merger, with many students, parents, and faculty feeling a loss of attachment and allegiance to the new school. The headmaster at the time was Mr. Robert Genowaldi. Bob sought for a way to solve the problem. He was convinced that something was needed to bridge the divide, which was still felt by many. He wanted to give the students a goal to unify them by working together and creating something unique, something they could be proud of. Besides being an administrator of the new Fairfield High School, Bob was also a professional musician, playing string bass with the Greenwich and Bridgeport symphonies. He was also the orchestra director at Staples High School in Westport for many years. With this background, he came up with the idea of a concert that would include every music student in the department. And when better to do this than in December, before the holidays? Dorothy Straub, another professional musician and a nationally well-known educator, was Fairfield's K-12 music coordinator and had just been elected president of MENC, which is the National Organization of Music Teachers. As president, she traveled around the country giving lectures and clinics, and during one of her trips to the Midwest, attended a Spectrum concert. The event was to have multiple groups perform uninterrupted with coordinated lighting. The concept was very exciting. But as the Fairfield High School music faculty found out, it was a monster of planning and executing. I want to give you some details of how this elaborate concert was managed. Simply put, it was organized around these seven parameters. First, the full array of ensembles was seated in the small gym so as to surround the audience. Second, the ensembles were illuminated using theatrical lighting instruments. Third, only the ensemble performing was illuminated and all others were in the dark. Fourth, the whole performance would be accomplished in under an hour. Dorothy wanted it to be 45 minutes. Fifth, there were no breaks in sound from ensemble to ensemble. Overlapping of the music was considered a good transition. Sixth, the audience was asked not to applaud until the end of the performance. And seventh, the finale was a combined ensemble of vocalists and instrumentalists performing the famous Hallelujah Chorus by Handel, which usually resulted in a standing ovation. The original site of Spectrum was the Fairfield High School small gym. The custodians would open the bleachers on both sides, one for the audience and the other side for the choirs. The orchestras and bands were seated on opposite sides near the basketball frames where the lights were hung. There was a balcony that allowed for the jazz ensemble to perform somewhat above the audience. An eight by eight foot platform was built and was considered the solo platform. It was situated in the center of the gym and was used for chamber music and soloists so as to allow the other students and teachers to move from one group to the other in the dark. The ushers 
led by Music Resource Center Secretary Barbara Thumb, were parents and community volunteers who took the tickets at the waiting area of the small gym. At the appointed time, families were allowed in to find seats. The ushers were forced to compress the audience so as to optimize the seat seating as most performances were sold out. Barbara told me that she gave out 800 tickets per performance. There, were no, there was no admission charge ever. The concert became so popular that we opened up the dress rehearsal to senior citizens who could not attend the evening shows. The extra lighting instruments, cables, and gels were rented from a firm in New Rochelle, New York. A school van was used to pick up all the equipment three days before the fir first downbeat. The power for the lighting instruments was found across the hall in the auditorium. We tied into the power there and ran cables into the gym. Chairs and all equipment used in the performance were set up by students, parents, and custodians. The cooperation witnessed during the process was palpable. It was hard work, but somehow it got everyone in the spirit. The program for the concert was printed at school. It was a wonderful collaboration between the graphic arts department and the music department. In the beginning, there were three performances of Spectrum, one on Friday at 5.30 p.m. and two on Saturday evening. The students were expected to bring all their concert gear to school on Friday morning, attend all their classes during the day, and then immediately at the end of school, go to the small gym for the dress rehearsal. It was a long day to say the least. The Music Parents Association came to the rescue by providing sandwiches, drinks, snacks, and desserts for the students and teachers. The entire musical portion was pre-recorded. We would have a single day to have each group go into the auditorium for a recording session. The day would conclude with everyone, or as many as we could fit, performing the Hallelujah Chorus. All the recording was done by Steve Sorper from Greenwich, who volunteered his time. I'd like to share with you a few anecdotes from the goings on backstage of Spectrum. Many students were in multiple performing groups. This forced the faculty to be very careful in putting the order of the program together. Students had to move in the dark while one ensemble was lighted in order to get to their next performing group, sometimes across the gym or one floor up. One year, a string bass player got the reward for performing in 16 out of the 18 selections. <laughs> He did, not, he did lots of moving around, and he never missed a downbeat. Although Spectrum was known mostly as a holiday concert, the program reflected a diverse selection of music. For instance, the wind ensemble played a contemporary piece entitled Flight. The chamber orchestra performed Mozart's Eine Kleine Nachtmusik. The jazz ensemble, Song of the Volga Boatmen, and then there was a student and faculty favorite sung by the chamber choir, Deck the Halls in 7-8 time. <laughs> During one memorable show, it was decided that someone should take a set of sleigh bells and run across the roof of the gym near the open windows to simulate Santa's sleigh flying by. Yes, we went to extraordinary measures to make magic happen. <laughs> One of my most vivid memories of the lighting process was in 1992. On the solo platform were three string bass players and a girl with handbells prepared to perform an arrangement of Ding Dong Merrily on High. The lights, for some reason, never turned on at the beginning of, the, of their piece, but all four students continued to play and finished in the dark from memory. Another solo platform adventure 
<laughs> was when we had a harpist come in 1993 and accompany a string player. The harpist needed help, of course, getting the instrument on the solo platform in the dark. She would get settled as quickly as possible, but with not much leeway. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief when the lights turned on and she started the piece. And then finally, not many people realize this, but the Hallelujah Chorus, which was used for the finale, was not exactly Handel's arrangement. The Hallelujah Chorus was originally written in the key of D major, with no clarinets, no saxophones or trombones, which didn't even exist at that time. Bob Genowaldi went to work and wrote out all the music for the bands and the orchestras in the key of C major. This made it much more manageable for student groups. Bob was an exceptional educator. Both Bob and Dorothy were at every performance, critiquing, advising, solving logistical problems, and making sure everything ran smoothly. Bob's goal to unite the school and the community was achieved. The response to Spectrum was so great that we ended up doing multiple performances back to back on Friday and Saturday. When it came time to rally the town to support the music department, we only had to mention the Spectrum concert as one of the shining examples of excellent music education. At this point, I would like to mention by name all the music teachers who were involved with Spectrum from 1987 to 2002. Bob and Dorothy were the prime movers. But at the very beginning, we had these fabulous band, choir, and orchestra teachers rolling up their sleeves and producing an excellent show. Roger Tuline, band director. Michael Bro, jazz ensemble director. Jim Papp, choir director. Janet Rosen Fantasi, orchestra director. And Lisa Betke, accompanist. I think Lisa should take a bow, another bow. <laughs> The following people came a few years later. Dorth Deborah Grazer, <laughs> Cheryl, Le <laughs> Cheryl Lebrecht, Mark Fisher, John Fumasoli, Roger Bryan, Silvana Fallone, Barbara Rao, Christopher Heisey, Todd Simmons, Anna Whitmore Lawler, Linda Zwickler, and Jeremy Fiftel. I think a few of those teachers are here now. Would you please rise and we thank you and acknowledge you. It's now 2002. The story takes an abrupt turn. Fairfield High School was split into two separate schools and the question was, how should we continue with the holiday concert now that we are the newly established Fairfield Ward High School. There were many hours of debate and discussion. Eventually, it was decided to continue offering a holiday concert, but we would change the venue to the auditorium and change the name of the concert to Carillon. The idea was instead of using lighting to transition from one musical selection to another, we would use bells, chimes, triangles, gongs, anything that rang or clanged. There certainly were advantages with the change. Better acoustics, more rehearsal time in the performance space, no need to displace the phys ed classes from the gym, no need to rent lighting equipment, and more comfortable seating for the audience. A completely new format was established for Carillon. The changes were made with the leadership of Donna Schmordell as the new music coordinator, as well as Michael Bro, band director, Jeremy Fiftel, choir director, and myself as orchestra director. The stage became the home for all the bands, wind ensemble, symphonic band, and jazz ensemble. The pit was used for the string groups. However, 
Both orchestras together were too large a number to fit in the pit, and therefore I had to make a decision whether to have only the symphonic orchestra perform or to have both orchestras involved. I wanted desperately to have every music student perform for the new carillon. Therefore, the decision was made to have the younger group perform at 6 p.m. and the senior orchestra at 8 p.m. The chamber orchestra was a small enough ensemble to, in size to use the front of the stage as well as on the, in the aisles. The choir moved in and around the audience in the aisles, on the steps and on the stage. The ability to navigate throughout the auditorium gave us flexibility and consequently allowed us to be more creative. Ask anyone from 2008 about the chamber orchestra's rendition of Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. Hint, there was dancing was part of the show. And let's not forget from 2009, the unique arrangement of the U Ukrainian bell carol by Marslin, Fiftel, and Grazer, a laser show with smoke. We therefore made the leap into a major alteration of Fairfield's cherished holiday event. The concept of Carillon was fairly similar in that music was continuous, no clapping between sections. One difference, the students were no longer required to wear their concert uniforms, but were asked to dress in holiday colors with the choirs draping themselves in wintry scarves. But the most obvious change was the choice of the final piece. It was entitled, At the Closing of the Year. That idea came from watching the movie Toys, featuring Robin Williams. The film opens with a concert in a toy factory that has the piece, Closing of the Year, being sung by a single female in a children's choir. It became readily apparent that this song starting slow and hymn-like and moving into a dance number could be a very exciting way to get people up and moving along with the students performing. Michael Brogue brought this idea to the faculty and we decided to find someone to arrange it for us. Peter DeMarco was selected and he closely worked with the faculty to bring out the best in what the students were capable of. There was a section in the middle that allowed the percussion to have a band room jam. Closing of the year became a much loved permanent finale, thoroughly enjoyed by the audience and the performers. And I'm so pleased that Peter DeMarco can be here today. Peter, we applaud you. We'd like you to stand, please. I would like to acknowledge those music teachers who were instrumental in continuing the Carillon tradition for the Fairfield Ward students and the town of Fairfield. Kevin Cottleys, Brian Borelli, Sam Eckhart, Loretta Lazarus, Susan Jimenez, Scott Marslin, Donna Schmardell, Jan Davis, Jeffrey Albright, George Croce, Jay Spadone, if any of those people are with us today, would you like to stand as well? So we not acknowledge you. <laughs> Having mentioned these teachers, I apologize to all the new music faculty for not acknowledging them as well. My teaching career in Fairfield ended in 2010, so I am not privy to those who came after me. These two very special concerts, Spectrum and Carillon, would not have existed without the vision of its creators, Bob Genowaldi and Dorothy Straub Genowaldi. Yes, Bob and Dorothy were happily married. <laughs> However, every music teacher that was involved with the process of producing another Spectrum Carillon concert, year after year, should also be applauded. These teachers work together tirelessly to make each concert a success. For me, it was inspiring as well to see the efforts, enthusiasm, and goodwill that the music students brought to the job. 
We all shared in the magic of the performance. They, the students, were the ones who made Spectrum and Carillon so memorable. And I think that there are some alums that are here. Would you please stand and we say thank you to you as well, all those alums. I'd like to thank the Fairfield Ward High School Honors Committee and Jim DaCosta for allowing me to share the story of Carillon with you. I am grateful that we rightly honor its creators, Bob and Dorothy Genowaldi. The performances of past Spectrum and Carillon concerts were inspiring. They lifted the spirits of students, audiences, and teachers. Because of today's ceremony, future generations of Fairfield Ward High School students and faculty will know Carillon's history, claim it as an inheritance, and use this story to shape their own future. Thank you. That was so wonderful. Thank you. I loved hearing the history. And um, my name is Jacqueline Saru Tate, class of 2008. Uh, and I just wanted to say that the closing of the year triple conducting that you did was the reason I wanted to become a conductor. So thank you for giving us these wonderful experiences. <laughs> And my name is Ashley Zadrovitz, and I graduated in 2009 at Fairfield Ward High School. And I'm now the elementary general music teacher at North Stratfield School um, for the past six years, which, which I'm extremely grateful for. And um, Miss Lisa Becky was my kindergarten through fifth grade general music teacher at McKinley. So, so, just so special. And I'm just honored to be a part of this presentation. The Carillon concert was such an incredible part of um, my high school experience and ultimately led, you know, one of the things that ultimately led me to become a music teacher um, to this day. So I'm extremely grateful and ex really excited to perform for you all. So thank you.
Hello again. Now that you've seen some of what we've accomplished here at Fairfield Ward High School, if you're a teacher at a different school, whether private or public, or if you're a member of a PTA, or just somebody who would like to <coughs> institute this at your school, <coughs> please reach out and contact me. My email address will be right across the screen. Thank you.